Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, philosopher, historian, Thomas Jefferson scholar. I'd like to invite you to the fourth in a, in a series of essays on Thomas Jefferson, the title of the series being The Sentimental Traveler Lectures. And uh, they are uh, intended to introduce you to a different side of Thomas Jefferson, one with which you might be unfamiliar, that's Thomas Jefferson the philosopher. The title of today's essay, today's lecture, is Are We Post Jefferson? Are, are we post Jefferson or post postmodernism? Uh, begin, let me begin by imagining a wayward traveler who begins a journey from Los Angeles, uh, passes through Salt Lake City, Boulder, Colorado, Wichita, and uh, is, is now um, on his, uh, somewhat outside, just outside of Chicago. And he passes uh, uh, just outside of Chicago. He stops in a small diner, has a cup of coffee, something to eat, and he's chatting about his traveling to the proprietor, and the fellow says, ah, I see you're traveling uh, eastward. Now imagine the fellow saying in re response, not really traveling eastward or westward, I don't really know where I'm going. All I know is where I've come from. Strange response, someone being on a journey not knowing where he's going. Joyce Appleby has something similar to say about Thomas Jefferson in an introduction to a collection of essays by Peter Onuf uh, titled, Jeffersonian legacies. This was done some years ago. She writes, Appleby writes, we live in a world of posts. The buildings going up around us are postmodern. Our literary criticism is post-structural. Our sociology post-positivist. Our legal scholarship is post-realist. Our political science post-behavioral. The whole era is post-industrial. Ours clearly is an age that knows where it has been and senses that it is no longer there. Implication is that we don't really know where we're going either. She then asks us to consider how does all this, uh, all the uh, this post phenomena relate to our our own self awareness and our understanding of Thomas Jefferson. Um, she says, "Our heart is moved by the things Thomas Jefferson said, things that he wrote, but our head is no longer with him. Our head has moved on." Is that really true? Um, She gives an illustration of Jefferson's preoccupation with a scientific phenomenon, and scientific argument. She says, uh, we have difficulty accepting Jefferson's arguments with their scientific loss of universal truths, first principles, and immutable norms. Uh, the axial words of the context in which we live, she thinks, today are pluralism, diversity, multiculturalism, and relativism. We've gone behind the scientific, we've gone beyond the scientific losses uh, uh, that Jefferson was immersed in. She continues, should we continue to reason without wearing concepts of nature and truth, we can be certain of one thing, she asserts baldly, Thomas Jefferson would not have. Now that bald assertion uh, in the form of a, a sock doliger, I think is not in the least compelling. I am certain that Jefferson would not adopt the, the, uh, uh, the uh, pluralism, the multiculturalism, the relativity she thinks that we, be we believe in today. I'm not even uh, certain why she thinks that's our world today. Um, consider our physics, astronomy, our biology, and even today's medicine. Now, Jefferson certainly would, would have been impressed, perhaps even overwhelmed, by several of our discoveries in physics. The, the conservation of energy, the law of entropy, the law of gravity, the constancy of the speed of light, the relativity of bodily motion, and of course the strange behavior of subatomic entities. Uh, he would be impressed by E equals MC squared as an improvement over Newton's F equals MA. He would be impressed by the Lorentz transformation and any of those such things in physics. Uh, looking at today's biology, I think he would be uh, impressed by DNA sequencing in microbiology. The, uh, the Darwinian discover of the, uh, uh, that species are not uh, unalterable, not fixed, but, uh, but they evolve. Uh, our, our heightened and broadened understanding of the medicines, uh, of medicines today compared to the medicines of Jefferson's time. Uh, our novel surgical technique, techniques, hip implants, knee replacements, things like the, the greater uh, apprehension that we have of human mentation today than we did in, in Jefferson's today uh, through, through our knowledge of the human brain. Um, 
even better understanding of behavior and intelligence of other animals that we have today. Um, he would, I think, especially be excited about the utilization of all such discoveries in the in, in the uh, in for for use in human flourishing. Jefferson always was excited about useful knowledge and knowledge that can be applied to human betterment. Um, I think he would no wise believe that such discoveries, such findings that we have in biology, astronomy, and, and, and physics and things like that, uh, we're relativistic posits, we're, we're products of this post-modernist culture that we have. Uh, these were things that in our day he would find are, you know, are, are immutable in, in uh, immutable truths, uh, for which uh, uh, immutable truths that we can uh, use to human, for human betterment in, in many cases. Now, one must acknowledge at least with Appleby that, that some of Jefferson's concepts are outworn, but it's not the concepts uh, of physics, biology, and things like that. that uh, uh, that I've just pointed out. Now, Jefferson thought that morality could be grounded in in uh, human in, in natural law, and that seems a bit strange. That political science, um, that species were fixed, and that the political science was it was an advancing science, just like anything else. And, and morality was an advancing science, like anything else. And that's a debatable question, at least. Um, yet, you know. Uh, and because of the movement in science, the advance of science over time, uh, there's the, the need for new concepts all the time. We, we have introduced mass, velocity, acceleration, inertia, temperature, and species. These are vital concepts in our day. They were vital concepts in Jefferson's time. Um, now, I think so that the notion of appealing to subjectivism, relativism, perspectivism, anti-realism, uh, with, uh, you know, how these concepts relate to many of the uh, our embrace of universal truths today is, 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 is unclear. Okay, now Appleby, in trying to, to, to force the argument that, that uh, Jefferson would have changed his mind where he lived today and, and uh, thrown aside his, his scientific glosses in favor of the, the many posts that Appleby says that we embrace today, I think that's a, a false claim. Uh, but Jefferson, you know, did have a relatively, she asked the question, actually, are we post-Jefferson? And that seems to be a really ridiculous question. And by implication, uh, she, she leaves it as a sort of, she asks it as a rhetorical question. I think the, the tenor of her introduction, her introductory essay, suggests that in a very real sense, we are post-Jefferson. We live in a different world. I think that's entirely false. But Jefferson did have a relatively elastic conception of language, right? He, uh, um, to grammarian John Waldo, he writes, I have been pleased to see that in all cases you appeal to usage as the arbiter of language and justly consider that as giving law to grammar and not grammar to usage. I concur entirely with you in opposition to plurals who would destroy all strength and beauty of style by subjecting it to rigorous compliance with their rules. End of quote. That was in 18... 13 in the letter to John Waldo. Now, Jefferson is, is appealing to change in, in the need of new concepts of language. He's not doing it for any, any um, relativistic out of need to accommodate uh, post-modernism, post-structuralism, relativism, or anything like that, uh, uh, different concepts in our day. He's doing it because science advances. Now, not all relativism clearly is hostile to truth. And Jefferson, I think, was a relativist, but was a relativist in a non-harmful way. Now, because of the advances of science in Jefferson's day, in keeping with advances in uh, human progress in other uh, uh, areas, uh, new concepts were needed. Jefferson writes to Joseph Milligan, nothing is more evident than that as we advance in the knowledge of new things and of new combinations of old ones, we must have new words to express them. To um, grammarian John Waldo, Jefferson ca uh, castigates any critics who would have us fix language for all time in, in the manner of Samuel Johnson's dictionary. He writes to Waldo, 
Certainly, so great growing a population spread over so such an extent of country with such a variety of climates of productions of arts must enlarge their language to make it answer its purpose of expressing all ideas, the new as well as the old. The new circumstances under which we are placed call for new words, new phrases, for the transfer of old words to new objects." End of quote. Uh, so it's not change to which Jefferson's appealing here, it's progressive change. That's the need for neologisms. In, in our language that makes it, the uh, neology necessary. Um, so consider certain neologisms in Jefferson's day, oxygen, uh, zoophytes and magnetism and things like that. There were um, you know, similar advances in political thinking brought on by the American French and French revolutions uh, where concepts such as equality, liberty, justice, uh, and even life, it's not that these concepts are new, but they took on different meanings, uh, especially you know, equality and liberty, uh, note the Declaration of Independence in that regard. Okay, it's one thing to say we could be post-Jefferson if we could embrace the notion that, not, that science is, is just another human activity that doesn't lead us to any particular direction, that science was no better epistemically, say, than religion or mythography. Um, that mythology, excuse me, mythology, that equality and liberty are mere, um, um, are mere constructs, uh, no better axiologically, we could say, than um, other, any other concepts, uh, than inequality or coercion. Jefferson thought uh, um, liberty and equality were, were terms that were vital, that, that were expressive of human moral growth and political growth. But I don't think, well, you know, in a post-modernist, post-structuralist, post-realist world, you know, inequality and coercion are just as robust and have uh, axiologically have just as much right to exist as equality and liberty. And who's to say which, which, is, uh, which pairing of the two uh, is, is better, is worse. Now, I don't think we would, we're going to be embracing inequality and coercion for any for, for a long, long time, simply because um, whether we recognize it or not, we have normative investments in science and concepts uh, and scientific concepts. And we have a moral investment in concepts such as liberty and equality. Okay, so in answer to the question we post Jefferson, I think absolutely not. That's a ridiculous question for one to be asking. I think instead we are post the post posits. We are post post structuralism, post post positivism, post post realism, post post behavioralism, and post post industrialism. Now, like Appleby, I under I acknowledge that post post modernism is a philosophy that knows where it has been and senses it's no longer here, it's, it's no longer there, but. I also recognize that it's a philosophy because of its it's mired in posts doesn't know where it's going, doesn't know where it's headed. And it's much the same, just like our wayward journeyer knows where he's come from, but that knows not where he's going. And that seems to be a, a ridiculous thing here. Um, the, the various posts in which Jefferson, in which Appleby thinks we live, um, th these posts that we, we embrace today, she says, um, is a matter of situating ourselves in negation and, and nullibiety. It's not to have a positive sense of identity in the least. That makes, you know, the world in which Appleby lives, at least, a most disconcerting, unbeautiful, disobliging, um, and uh, in following Jefferson's own sense of, of, of things, it's, uh, it's a it's a world that's rather disobliging when it, when it comes to human needs. Now, for those of you who are interested in more about me or more about Thomas Jefferson, please go to my webpage, www.thomasjeffersonphilosopher.com. That's one word, thomasjeffersonphilosopher.com, and there you can download a large number of short essays. Um, you can download the printed version of this um, particular lecture here and uh, learn more about Jefferson as a philosopher and, and learn more about me.